works uh, tonight to a passage of Scripture that I had been hearing all of my life. And I had been hearing a certain interpretation of that text, which further study revealed to me is more often than not the wrong interpretation. And so I want to use this as a platform to explain the biblical mandate for churches and Christians to be engaged in the political process. Something that I hear many of my own colleagues and ministers constantly contend that churches should not do. I beg to differ with them. And I will suggest to you tonight that I differ with them on the basis of what God has said in his own word. The text that I draw your attention to is one I'm sure you're familiar with. It comes from Matthew chapter 22. These are the words. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him, that is Jesus, in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar, or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a denarius. And he saith unto them, Whose image is on this coin? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Now let me begin tonight with a question, asking you something that I think all of us are quite commonly familiar with. Have you ever forgotten something? The truth of the matter is, forgetfulness is an experience with which we are all familiar. Even preachers forget. I'm reminded this evening of a story of how this one pastor, young pastor, talking with an older, experienced minister about the challenges that he would face in church life. And one challenge that especially fascinated this young pastor was the wedding ceremony. He had never performed one before. And so he listened very carefully as this older, more experienced minister outlined for him each step that he was supposed to take. And in conclusion, the wise old minister advised him, now, if you ever forget what to say, which happens to preachers, if you ever go blank, he said, just quote scripture. It's always appropriate, especially at a wedding. Well, shortly thereafter, this young pastor had the opportunity to test his newly gained knowledge when a couple requested that he perform their wedding ceremony. And everything went perfectly according to plan up until that moment in the service where he was to pronounce them husband and wife. And at that point, his mind went completely blank. He could not remember what to say next to save his life. But suddenly the advice of that old minister came back to him. Just quote scripture, quote scripture. It's always appropriate, especially at a wedding. Unfortunately, the only scripture that came to his mind, which he dutifully quoted was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. Amen. Now, I didn't tell that silly story to disparage the great institution of marriage, hardly. 
<coughs> but simply to illustrate that memory is something that can be a bit of a mixed blessing. Wouldn't you agree? Granted, to be able to forget some things and not to have to remember their pain, the intensity of some trial or failure in life, I would suggest forgetting something like that can be one of the great blessings of life. Nevertheless, there are other matters that we must never forget concepts, ideas, lessons of life, experiences rife with values that we must always remember. We cannot afford to forget them. I have been saying to churches all over this state for 17 years, I suggest to you that America today is in the greatest moral meltdown of its history because the church has seemingly forgotten the real meaning and obligations of its dual citizenship. We are indeed, speaking of the church, natives of the natural world, inhabitants of the country. But we are also first and foremost citizens of the kingdom of God. And in our text, the religious leaders of Jesus' day were trying to entrap him with a loaded question, saying, now Jesus, we know Listen to the flattery here now. Jesus, we know that you are an individual who truly serves God. And you, Jesus, you don't bow down to any man. So tell us, is it right to give tribute to Caesar? Now, of course, the slyness of their inquiry was really to try and box Jesus in. Because, you see, if our Lord said no, then he would likely be in trouble with the authorities for encouraging tax evasion, even treason against the emperor. If Jesus answered the question by saying yes, then he would likely garner the dismay and the disappointment of the people who strongly believed that the Messiah was someone who would deliver them from Roman occupation. So you see, either way that Jesus answered the question, they expected to be able to trap him and diminish his credibility. They expected to win by making him unpopular. But their devilish scheme backfired as Jesus outwitted them with his answer. Show me the tribute money, he said to them with some frustration. And they brought him the coin. Whose image is on this denarius, he asked them. And they answered, Caesar's, which is the same as to say the emperor's with such authority. Therefore, replied Jesus, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Now, may I attempt to garner your strictest attention at this juncture, because I am convinced that if you do not understand the next few statements that I am about to make, you will struggle with the meaning of all of what I'm going to say hereafter. Many in our time, sadly, I suggest, wrongly interpret these words of our Lord by setting up what I call a false dichotomy, meaning essentially arguing that the state has authority over certain things such as politics while God 
has authority over certain things such as our religious obligations. But actually, in this text, Jesus is speaking from what we could call the lesser to the greater. And what Jesus is really saying is, if it is true that you have obligations to Caesar, if it is true that you have obligations to the emperor, if it is true that you have obligations to the state, how much greater your obligations to God. Yes, the people had a legitimate debt to their government for its many protections and its benefits, but that is a far cry from saying, as too many have reason today, that the authority of the state is in some way separate and removed from the authority of God. I like the commentary that is provided by Dr. Joel McDermott of American Vision on our text. This is what he writes, and I quote him. He says, we are all we are all God's coinage. We all belong wholly to God. All men must therefore render unto God what is God's. All men. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herods, the Basses, even Caesar himself. Caesar has as much obligation to render unto God, to bow and submit to God as everyone else. He has as much obligation to love his neighbors and to obey God's laws as everyone else. He is not a God. He's not the source of law and providence. He, like all men, is a man subject to God Almighty's providence and God's law. And he has as much obligation to obey. In fact, he has a greater obligation to obey because he represents multiple people in a public office. And I suggest to you that Jesus' contemporaries understood his answer in exactly this way. Yes, as citizens of an earthly kingdom, we must render unto the state what rightfully belongs to the state. But let me underscore this next statement. We must never forget that the state has no right to claim for itself what belongs to God. Amen. Nor is it that the state has authority over my taxes, but God has authority over my tithes. It is more that all of what I possess actually belongs to God. Caesar may have his image stamped on a coin, but God has his image stamped on me. And the state may drive its stake here and there and claim this or that as its own. But in reality, as the psalmist said, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I suggest that this was not only the understanding of Jesus' contemporaries of what he was actually saying, but it was also the understanding of most of the church throughout church history in obedience to Christ's directive to preach the gospel of personal salvation unto the whole world, teaching the nations whatsoever he had commanded the church engaged the culture with Christian precept and positively changed the entire planet. 
Mind you, it was through the work of Christian churches that hospitals and charitable organizations were first founded. Did you realize that such did not even exist before Jesus and the church? Most of the world's greatest institutions of higher learning were started by Christians for Christian purposes. Literacy and education for the masses, capitalism and free enterprise, representative government, civil liberties. Why do we not hear a great deal about civil liberties today? Can I give you a great piece of information? Did you realize that there's not a place anywhere in the world where civil liberties exist, where the gospel of Jesus Christ was not first preached? Civil liberties came about because of Christianity. The ACLU needs to put that in their pipe and smoke it. <laughs> the abolition of slavery what ended that in this country it was mostly driven by Christians driven by the churches the elevation of women other than something than the property of a man children and the common man raised higher standards of justice a high regard for human life because the image of God is stamped on every man a sexual ethic that not only preserved the human race but has saved it from untold heartbreak the codified in writing of many of the world's languages, the inspiration of the greatest works of art, and countless changed lives from liabilities to assets for society because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am absolutely convinced in my own case that I would have likely been addicted to drugs would have likely led a wasted life if someone had not presented to me the liberty that there is in the gospel of Christ. And I tell you, these great advances came about not only in America but in many places around the world because the church did not separate its evangelistic endeavors from its civic responsibilities. It did not divide politics from spirituality, but instead deemed that everything belongs to God and nothing is exempt from his authority. The religious leaders of Jesus' day used the coin of Caesar to enrich themselves with the temple taxes and other endeavors. And so Jesus says to them, you have to pay back. Yet he qualifies by contending that this is an exceedingly small responsibility in comparison to their duty to render unto God their whole heart, their entire soul, and every aspect of human living. And the message that I share with so many churches and that I share with you and those of you who claim Christ as your own Lord, I say to them, it is this message that we must once again proclaim. In error, sometimes out of fear and sometimes in outright rebellion, our churches have separated their theology from civil government and we have segregated holy writ from the body politic and we have treated as isolates 
our responsibility to proclaim Jesus Christ as Savior for the soul from our responsibility to also proclaim that those little babies subject to the abortionist night belong to God. That the institution of marriage belongs to God. That to educate our children with no Christian principle is to simply make educated pagans out of them. Addressing the great social issues of our time, despite the contention of many of my preacher friends, does nothing to hinder our efforts at evangelism. Instead, I suggest it is the springboard for presenting Jesus Christ to the masses. And so I say, with something of a broken heart, may God forgive us. May He forgive us for limiting the scope of the gospel message. We seem to have forgotten that when man rejected the law of God in Eden, he not only lost the power to govern himself, but he lost the power to rightly govern society. And thus public tyranny and oppression have characterized most of man's existence in the world. But I would that every one of you here would hear this message, not simply with your ears, but with your heart. Christ's death on that cross liberates men. It liberates them from the slavery of their brokenness, a brokenness that the Bible refers to as sin. And it restores our ability to be self-governing. And also, therefore, renews our capacity for just civil government. And although it is true that Christ's ministry was primarily focused on issues pertaining to the heart, we dare not fail to see that much of what he taught was about the forms of external freedom that are born from the new birth that Christ creates within. In Luke chapter 4 verse 18, when Jesus preached the message that officially hailed the beginning of his message, he spoke about liberty for the captives, those who were oppressed. There's no question that the social issues of slavery, tyranny, poverty, and various forms of justice were on Christ's mind at that time. In Jesus' last words, which are stated in the Great Commission, our Lord commands His followers to make disciples of all nations. Matthew Henry, the renowned Bible commentator, of the 18th century rightly expounded upon that text saying the principle of intention of 